It's Parliament that makes the headlines with legislation. But no bill passed by Parliament or Majlis becomes law without going through the Guardian or Constitutional Council. Less in the spotlight normally, there are times when this Council of Elders becomes the highlight of the day. One of those times is elections, be they parliamentary, presidential or assembly of experts elections. What exactly the function of the guardians of the constitution is when it comes to elections is the focus of our study in this episode. The 12-member Guardian Council of Legal Experts supervises elections and approves or disqualifies candidates. It also has veto power over legislation. It's something of an upper house, so omitting it from Iran's legal system would be unthinkable. However, it does come under scrutiny and criticism from time to time, especially with the 2021 elections. I'm Leila Faramazi and you're watching Iran Today. The council chaired by Ayatollah Jannati approved only seven candidates to run for president in the June 18th election. That was out of a total of 592 prospective candidates, 552 men and 40 women. The list of candidates or finalists was communicated on May the 25th and has since kept eyebrows raised with foreign critics who incessantly bring the conservative council under attack. Mr. Atrianfar is among those at home expressing displeasure at the Guardian jurist selection. He is a reformist and member of the executives of Construction Party, who met with us at Press TV Studios. هیچگاه نباید نهادهای حقوقی به خصوص شورای نگهبان جهادگیری Legal institutions, especially the Constitutional Council, must never be politically biased. The Council was expected to adhere to this standard for the upcoming election. When a large number of people, at least 40 prominent figures among them, had registered to run for president, the political bias resulted in the elimination of almost every candidate who had political links with the reformists or was favored by like-minded institutions and were barred from the race. The situation at this point is so that out of seven esteemed presidential candidates, five definitely belong to the principalists and the two others don't represent the reformists. Well now, the more conservative or principalist walk of Iran's political spectrum wouldn't want to leave that unanswered. I got to talk to a couple of parliamentarians to hear them on whether the guardians might have made a political decision, when in fact they are to vet candidates based on their legal credentials and existing documents. Mr. Noruzi is vice chief of the parliamentary legal committee. Anyway, if the reformists hadn't introduced weak or problematic figures, they would definitely have the chance to see their candidates approved. I'm not a member of the Constitutional Council, but my question is, why didn't the reformists introduce Mr. Arif? Why didn't they put forth figures who could be qualified to run? Anyhow, they endorse people like Mr. Jahangiri, who have their own problems. Mr. Jahangiri has to be accountable for the economic problems in the past eight years because he has been the first vice president, a position comparable to the country's prime minister. He can't come forward and complain. He must first explain what he's been doing in the past eight years and then run for president. Besides Mr. Raisi, the judiciary chief, other principalists approved to run are Saeed Jalili, former Supreme National Security Council secretary and nuclear negotiator, Mohsen Rezai, Expediency Council secretary, as well as MPs Ali Reza Zakani and Amir Hossein Ghazi Zadeh Hashemi. Non-principalists are Abdul Nasser Hemmati, Central Bank of Iran, former governor, who's a moderate, and Mohsen Mehrali Zadeh, reformist, former vice president. Registration and vetting and campaigning make for an intricate electoral procedure, intricate like Iran's political system of several member bodies, each presiding over the other. 
Everything is detailed and foreseen in the hope of leaving no room for error. But then, with too many hands at work, it can, like bureaucracy, trip itself up. And there's human error that can presumably occur with these supreme deciding bodies. Sometimes, as in the case of Larijani, despite the fact that he is a veteran, the Supreme National Security Council's decision to ban first-degree relatives of candidates from studying abroad leads to disqualification. We don't have anything called disqualification in the presidential election. In fact, we assess the qualification of those who run. This doesn't mean that those who aren't approved are unfit or incompetent for other tasks or positions. What Article 155 stipulates is that the qualified president must meet a set of conditions, including being a political or religious figure, being a resourceful manager, being a citizen of Iran and of Iranian origin. Members of the Constitutional Council consider these conditions for every candidate and finally announce whether or not the individuals are eligible to run for president after a secret ballot. Mr. Zakir is chief of the parliamentary Article 90 committee. Mr. Larijani has been more of a principalist than a reformist. If he's rejected, it wasn't because he was a reformist. If candidates request explanations about why they have been disqualified, the Constitutional Council can tell them. The candidate can also make it public. There is no legal prohibition against it. But there is usually a convincing reason and expert work behind the decision. Sometimes the case of Mr. Mehrali Zadeh can find itself repeated. He was disqualified in one election due to the fact that a case was pending against him, but in the next round he was approved due to acquittal. According to Article 115 of the Constitution, the president must meet certain conditions. One is that he must be of Iranian origin. The other is that he must be a political or a religious figure and be a resourceful manager. None of these conditions are biased for or against any group, camp, or political organization. The conditions consider the candidate's talents, policy making, and management capabilities in running the country and solving its problems. It's an executive hand that's in charge of jump-starting and finalizing the election process in practice. That's the Interior Ministry. Pursuant to Article 48 of the election law, executive boards send the names of candidates to four authorities for screening. Those are the Judiciary, the Ministry of Intelligence, the Police, and the Civil Registration Organization. Now, how Guardian Council members themselves are appointed and what the composition of the body looks like, you may care to know. Of the 12 jurists, six of them are experts in Islamic law and they are appointed by the leader, who is himself elected by the Assembly of Experts. The other six civil jurists are nominated by the Supreme Judicial Council and appointed by Parliament or Majlis. The Council also has six lawyers recommended to Parliament by the head of the judiciary to be confirmed and included in the Council. Following the Islamic Revolution of 1979, although the Constitution has it that the members of the Guardian Council must be changed every six years, three years after the establishment of the Guardian Council, six members from amongst both batches of the jurists, Islamic and civil, were changed. This policy was adopted in order to prevent any temporary closure of the Guardian Council. This way, the Council will always have have six definite members. As a result, the system is so that six members of the 12 members of the Guardian Council undergo a reshuffle every three years. Regarding the Council's participation in national events, our MPs speak of how it safeguards the Islamic Revolution through these, say through elections. According to the Constitution, the President is the country's second most important figure after the leader. He's the one who has to execute cultural, social, political, commercial, monetary, financial, banking, petrochemical and other laws. Any candidate who wins the election must be able to bring everyone together from across the country. If this happens, the revolution thrives and the country will be united. 
If the elected president is chosen based on meritocracy, the country will be united, free of conflict and revolutionary. The Constitutional Council is responsible to ensure that. The Council has thought for some 800 hours to select which candidate can run the country for the next four or eight years. I said the Guardian Council is inseparable from the country's system of legal and political governance as it stands. Interestingly, even its critics, at least domestic political ones, don't criticize it as a body. We shouldn't criticize the Constitutional Council itself, as the leader of the Islamic Revolution has also stressed. We should protect the prestige and identity of the legal institutions as enshrined in the Constitution. But we can criticize the performance of the Council's members. During the leadership of late Imam Khomeini, if the members of the Constitutional Council made any mistakes, he would criticize them and advise them to correct their behavior. We should question those who didn't vote for Mr. Larijani and ask them to explain what their argument has been. Now, whatever strategy or insight might leave the last man standing, it's all for elections to be held, for the people to choose a new president. Time for a short break. We'll be back in no time. Incumbent President Rouhani's second term is coming to a close, with very little time left for the Vienna JCPOA talks to conclude in sanctions relief for Iran. Any success the outgoing government has with the talks would be cause for greater voter turnout mid-June. I'm only half done, but it's time to give other media outlets time for their say as well. So for a quick media review, stay tuned. And here's words they put it in. Farce News reads, leader asks Iranian people to stage large turnout in elections. During a meeting via video link with members of the Iranian parliament on Thursday, May the 27th, Ayatollah Khamenei first thanked all individuals who were nominated to run in elections. Many of these people undoubtedly entered the scene because they felt a responsibility to, he said. Secondly, Ayatollah Khamenei said, I have to doubly thank those whose qualification was not approved and was not ascertained by the council and who reacted nobly. Some of them even encouraged people to participate in the election. The leader said the fact that the Constitutional Council had not been able to ascertain the qualification of certain candidates did not mean that those individuals were not qualified. They may even be highly qualified. What it meant was that the Council had not been able to determine such a qualification based on its own recognition, the reports and the available tools. Dear Iranian nation, election takes place in one day, but its outcome is there for several years. Participate in the election. Consider the election as belonging to yourselves, because it does belong to you, Ayatollah Khamenei said. Tehran Times quotes the council's spokesperson, Kat Khodai, predicts high voter turnout. In an interview with Press TV on Tuesday, Abbas Ali Kat Khodai said when it comes to verification and vetting, the impact of the Constitutional Council's votes on the people's participation is very little. That, he said, is what opinion polls conducted by state institutions show. It's usually most likely about economic issues and maybe some political and social issues. He said the council carries out its responsibilities based on the constitution as the fundamental law of the country and is duty bound to do the vetting process. If a person is vetted and not approved, we are not to blame. We have to act on the basis of law. We have Abna referring to a Sunni cleric saying vigilant nation attends election to decide for its fate. A Sunni Friday prayer leader in southeastern Iran believes that the Iranian nation are vigilant and will participate in the upcoming presidential election across Iran to decide their own fate. 
Molavi Abdurrahim, Rigyanpur, Sunni Friday prayer leader of Mirjava, a city in southeastern Iranian province of Sistan, Baluchistan, made the remarks in an interview with Irna. Participation in the elections is a religious duty and respect for objectives of Imam Khomeini, the father of the Islamic Revolution, the Sunni cleric said. During the past years, enemies, arrogant powers, and global Zionism have in vain been trying to downgrade the people's participation in Iran's elections, he added. Despite the sanctions, Iran will powerfully stand on its own feet, the Sunni cleric stressed. That would be it for this segment. Do stay tuned. Foreign policy will no doubt pose pretty potent challenges for any new president and his cabinet. Let's hear what they will face from our show guests. The president must run the country. It is not possible to run a country without interacting with the world. We have had relationships with all the world when both principalists and reformists were incumbent, with a few exceptions like the occupying Israeli regime. As a matter of fact, if principalists win the upcoming election, they would have greater interactions with the world. We want to maintain our country's authority. Now, the main challenge any new president would face in this country has got to be economic. That is why the JCPOA talks matter. To Iran, the whole point of the talks is that US and E3 economic sanctions be lifted off this country. Only then will a US return to the JCPOA or Iran nuclear deal even matter to us. You see, our economic structure is really in shambles. Our currency and tax system are in disarray. There are so many unemployed youths. 12 million young people aren't getting married because they don't have a home. While the Minister of Roads and Urban Development says he doesn't believe in cheap housing options just for the sake of being stubborn and based on his personal beliefs, it's evident that the country won't thrive. I think the Constitutional Council can intervene here and choose capable candidates fairly, regardless of their political orientation. They should approve people who won't make the society bipolar or tripolar or South Discord and only consider themselves. Interestingly, not all Iranian authorities see sanctions as wholly bad. In fact, the absolute majority see a use in sanctions alongside the vice. That is getting closer to independence, because with deprivation comes resistance economy. That's moving to mobilize the country's industry, hence independence. That is not to say sanctions are not a nuisance, of course, even to domestic manufacture. Developing domestic manufacture can be achieved with technology transfers and investments made possible by the lifting of sanctions. This in turn would enable greater growth and lucrative exports for Iranian industries. And fortunately, in the absence of Western alliance, Iran still has some useful friends elsewhere. He won't be just a president, but someone whose performance shapes the country's political future for at least the next 10 to 20 years. Our citizens' psychological comfort and economic security are affected and take shape by the president's policies on economic issues as the country's senior executive manager. This is unanimously agreed upon. Society expects the same, so do our political elites, the incumbent government, and most importantly, the leader of the Islamic Revolution. We popped out and learned what people think of shortcomings and what they expect of their next president. One of the most serious problems is that people's purchasing power is very weak. There is tremendous economic pressure on them. I expect the new president to care more about the youth. All the young people are unemployed. Some of them want to leave the country. They don't want to stay in Iran. The most urgent priority is employment. Anyone who wants to be president in the new term, as the leader said, must be the most efficient politician and fully familiar with the flaws in the system. One priority is the creation of jobs for young people, which has been very weak. The other is the astronomical prices, and another is enabling young people to get married. 
One of the main weaknesses of our current president is that he has not fulfilled any of his promises so far. The least the next president is expected to do is to care for those who live in a poor economic situation. People's most important demand is that the president be able to address their problems and create jobs. Like many things related to Iran, its Guardian Council comes under international criticism in great part due to the country's system of governance being a new. It's a democracy with a name, an Islamic democracy. The Guardian or Constitutional Council as a legal body is not dissimilar to any other in the world. In France, the Constitutional Council is the highest constitutional authority. The principle of supervision is observed by all countries, whether those in Europe, the US or elsewhere. But the methods differ according to the nature of the countries. Considering that our constitution has a religious basis, part of the responsibility of the Constitutional Council is to ensure that the resolutions don't violate religious laws. The Council's members generally are tasked with ensuring that the past laws are based on the constitution. Its duties are first the supervision of elections and ensuring the legitimacy of referendums. That's going by Articles 58, 59 and 60. And second, the interpretation of the fundamental meanings of the Constitution, legislation and treaties. It is a Zionist thought to polarize the elections. The instance is Trumpism or Bidenism. They polarize the society, and instead of proposing their plans, they locked their horns and got involved in their private affairs, shouted and insulted each other. The result was that Congress came under a deadly attack. Our elections don't polarize the people. The election is multipolar. Different personalities are nominated and qualified who later compete in a healthy environment and are chosen by the people according to their plans discussed during ethical debates. To get back to Iran's Guardian Council and elections, the Council's 25th May approval of finalists meant those candidates could start campaigning until June the 16th, two days before the election. That would allow for a one-day period when campaigning is banned. Candidates will have three televised debates, which could swing the vote against all expectation, as they have done so with the past three presidents. The Interior Ministry has said it could extend voting until 2 a.m. on June the 19th, since the polls will not operate at full capacity in order to observe COVID-19 guidelines. The reformists are now considering the options in a situation where their prominent nominees, including Mr. Asaq Jahangiri, Mr. Pazishkian, Mr. Mohsen Hashemi, Mr. Shariat, and others are rejected. They are probably planning to endorse the two reformist leading candidates for now and decide on who would withdraw from the race in favor of the other on the eve of the election day based on their popularity in opinion polls.
That's it for today. Thanks for watching from the whole team. But do tune in again at the same times next week and each week after, as there's plenty more to be said on the elections in weekly shows and even our 10-minute specials in the run-up to the election 18th June. Bye for now.